Howdy, my name is Seth Murray. I'm a professor at Texas A&M University. I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about uh, unoccupied aerial systems and how we use temporal phenotyping and phenomic selection for my maize breeding and uh, genetics program. So I want to first remind everybody about genomics. It's one of my backgrounds, and I'm sure people are much more familiar with genomics. Um, in 1986, there was an idea of QTL linkage mapping, where we'd begin to find loci, maybe eventually identify the genes uh, through map-based cloning, and then use that in plant breeding programs. And while this just generated a tremendous amount of knowledge, a lot of students graduated, a lot of publications, I really struggle, at least in my crop, to point to too many examples or any examples where crop improvement has occurred. In 2005, there was the focus uh, shifted a little more to association mapping or GWAS, and the same results have pretty much happened. I mean, we don't see a lot of crop improvement that came from that. But in 2007, uh, you know, building on a lot of other work, Bernardo and you came up with this concept of uh, genomic selection or genome-wide selection, and we've seen that rapidly adopted by industry. A lot of people use that for crop improvement. It's really good for knowledge generation. Um, but unfortunately, now that those models have been sort of developed, uh, you can't really do much in graduate student training or publication. But the overall trend here is one of discovery or estimation moving to prediction. And for an applied breeding program such as mine, uh, that's really enticing. So I'm primarily here to talk to you today about high throughput field phenotyping. And if we think about the breeder's equation, high throughput field phenotyping can hit a number of these, allowing us to grow more plants or measure those plants better. So far, what most people are talking about is automating routine measurements. So for instance, plant height. Um, it's an important trait in my program. It takes a lot of effort, especially in the hottest part of the summer to measure. Uh, maybe we can do that with drones or with uh, field vehicles. In other crops like sorghum and wheat where the panicle is out, uh, people are using it to estimate grain yield. And now we've started even using it to estimate uh, disease pretty accurately. But to me, that's not really very exciting. That's sort of using the old QTL model. What's more exciting to me is doing something new and finding new signatures of eliteness, such as temporal growth patterns or biomass or spectral signatures. And all these things in green are things I'm gonna to talk to you briefly about today. This moves us into the most exciting area, uh, which is phenomic selection. And phenomic selection is based on the concept of genomic selection, ex except using random phenotypic features instead of random genetic markers. So it's a totally different way to think about high throughput field phenotyping. Now, all three of these components are going to be useful for uh, us to identify stress signatures for farmers to be able to better manage their crop, and that's really important. And then I'm really interested in this ability to identify new phenotypes or mechanisms of biological importance uh, that previously were unable to be unknown. I'll show you an example of that today. So our earliest work in this area was to model plant height, as mentioned. And so what I'm showing you here is the Genomes to Fields program over three different trials, a dry land, uh, an optimal, and a late planting and two different uh, vehicles, a, uh, uh, a fixed wing aircraft, the tough wing, and then a DJI Phantom 3 Pro. And this is a little bit of an older study here. What was really important for us is we were able to measure plant height temporally. So previously we could only measure at the end of the season at this point uh, and not earlier in the season. And one of the things we noticed is the, the lines that were tallest at the end of the season weren't necessarily tallest earlier on leading to a different, uh, additional phenotypic features that we could use in our selection program. Now, in my environment, this is particularly important because the correlation to grain yield of plant height uh, is fairly high. Our correlation using the UAS or the drone tool um, was much higher than our traditional manual measurement because we had these temporal features throughout the season. So this was a really exciting result that got me uh, super engaged in, in this idea of phenomics. So Steven Anderson, who uh, led the last study, also use this in a genetic mapping population. And we discovered something that was really exciting, which was uh, the emergence of QTL that we can't detect again at the end of the season. So Stephen modeled uh, growth using a logistic uh, growth model and was able to predict how tall all the plants in the population were at every single day throughout the growing season for three different populations. And what's really exciting is a QTL like this that fades in and fades out but we would never identify it if we only measured plant height at the end of the season. So there's additional ways that the plant is interacting with the environment, which we can now genetically characterize. And that's about the last of the genomic uh, work I'll talk about. So expanding on this, uh, Natalia Cruzado, who's still a PhD student with me, um, took the structural features of something like plant height, but then added a whole bunch of spectral features. And she was able to estimate a total of 532 variables so that's 28 different phenotypic features, different vegetation indices calculated in different ways. 
over 19 flights throughout the growing season. And what she was able to find is we could, we could predict using a linear model, which is by far for the most efficient, the top 10% of yielders in this Genomes to Fields program, uh, just using some subset of three of these features over three flight dates. Now the R squared isn't really all that great, but we don't really care about predicting the worst material. Uh, we're really hoping to predict, or the, the, the middle material, we, we'd like to throw out the worst material, but we really care about predicting uh, the highest material. Now, what was really exciting in this case that underlied some new uh, bio biology um, was that the three flight dates were May 2nd, May 30th when flowering occurred, and June 3rd, and using different features extracted from uh, all NGRDI, but different ways of extracting NGRDI. Um, and this is really exciting because most physiologists will tell you that all the grain yield is made between flowering and grain fill, which would be around this period of June 23rd. Um, these other two dates are sort of new variation that we've never been able to measure before or capture. But a question remains, is this prediction based on something physiological or is it just based on relatedness such as genomic selection is? So another uh, example from Natalia here is looking at this NGRDI over time um, on uh, seven specific hybrids. So we have three unrelated commercial checks, plus we have four uh, uh, lines from my breeding program with sharing a common parent of TX714. And what we can clearly see here is the lines that are half sibs sharing that common parent have spectral features that are more similar throughout the growing period than these unrelated commercial checks. And that tells me that uh, relatedness is probably a, a larger feature uh, of, this, of this than um, something actually structural. So moving on to an actual breeding population, because before this, we were talking about genomes to fields, which is a sort of a diversity panel of the sort. Um, my student, Alper Adak, uh, used uh, 100 elite hybrids grown under two conditions, irrigated and dry land, um, to create two environments, really, uh, and tried to use some of these vegetation indices to predict things uh, in elite hybrid trials. And I only mainly put this slide up here is to give you a little background and then show you some of the many tools, because there's a lot of different packages uh, that need to be used in processing this data. Now, the first thing he, he sort of figured out uh, in how to use phenomic data uh, is how to run a, 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 a T-blot model. So he developed this idea of using a temporal blot model uh, that includes a lot of different things we want to estimate across, in this case, many different vegetation indices here on the uh, x-axis. And we can see the repeatability of all of these is fairly high. We can also see from this red color that the flight date explains the majority of information uh, in this, but we have a lot of pedigree information left in some of these indices and not a lot of residual variation. So there is a, a good uh, chance to use these in type of, in a term of a repeatable heritable measurement. So the other thing he did was plot this uh, feature over time. And what you can see is that uh, the highest yielding ones in yellow here in the crop height model uh, clearly stand out from the lowest yielding ones in orange. And we can also see this in some of these other vegetation indices over time. So for instance, in this very index, the highest yielding here uh, is up top, and here the lowest yielding here is up top. Um, so these vegetation indices, the more we generate, uh, the more we can sort of tease out the various genetic differences in breeding. So this leads me to phenomic selection. That's really where um, I want to I want to take everybody here today. And this was an amazing uh, paper by Rinson et al. in 2018. I, I encourage everybody to read it. It's absolutely fabulous. They used both wheat and poplar near-infrared spectroscopy to predict complex traits. And what they found was phenotypic, uh, phenomic selection um, was as accurate as genomic selection, but cheaper. And so uh, some of my colleagues and students and I wanted to follow this up. And we happened to have a, a genome-wide association study that was published a while ago. and. Um, I'll first just give you a brief background on near-infrared spectroscopy for those of you who might not be familiar. Uh, you use a machine like this. It's a benchtop NIR machine. It's scanning the samples with near-infrared light and measuring the absorbance across thousands of uh, spectral wavelengths. We then grind that corn. We, we scan it again. We send it for chemical analysis, so we outsource most of that to develop a partially squares training calibration. So in this way, we can predict thousands of samples uh, spending uh, wet chemistry money for only a couple hundred. And so we've done this for starch and oil, protein and phosphorus and oleic acid and lots of other traits. I mean, you can really develop these for anything. So what this allows us to do again is find this predictive equation and then scan additional corn and predict what other samples are. 
Now, sometimes I hear criticism about this that we're sort of making up data and we don't actually have, but I think the important thing to think about in breeding research is we have a vast amount of, of samples that come from growing in more environments and growing more replicates than we can usually afford to actually phenotype accurately. And so when I show this to my engineering colleagues, um, these are near infrared spectroscopy predictions or calibrations. Uh, the actual value is here on the x-axis, and then the predicted value is on the y-axis. And for a trait like crude protein, which has a, a nitrogen uh, group, near infrared spectroscopy does really well predicting these samples. So you'd see that line, you'd say, oh, that's a great calibration. Now, when we look at phosphorus, it looks really noisy. So people would say that that's a bad calibration, right? Um, and the range of variation is the same here. But what's interesting is once we actually take these predictions and apply them in our breeding program, where we've got thousands of samples grown across environments with more genotypes, we find that the genetic uh, variance is about the same in all of these. And interestingly, the unexplained error is actually lower for the phosphorus calibration. And so that led us into a, uh, a simulation study um, showing that high throughput can actually produce better decisions than high accuracy. So there's a lot of focus all the time on how we need to phenotype things more accurately. We find with UAS or drone measurements of height, they are more accurate. But in other cases, we don't really know. But what uh, my former master's student, Holly Lane, found, uh, in addition to the phenomic selection study I'm going to show you, um, is that we can make up for, um, so this is how well the, the, the simulated data fit with, um, uh, the actual data fit with uh, the predicted data. And using the most uh, accurate measurements here, obviously we have the best prediction power, uh, but we can make up if we only had one environment, we can make up for that by growing, let's say five environments, right? And so even if there's more error, we can compensate uh, for uh, error by growing more, more plants. So what Holly did with the near infrared spectroscopy information that was collected uh, was work with Dr. Jose Crosa using functional regression um, to develop a phenomic selection model based on Rinsit et al. And what we saw was really exciting. Um, training on 1,500 samples and testing on 848 samples from this uh, hybrid GWAS panel in my program, you can see how well uh, this data actually fit. So we, ab we absolutely were able to predict um, unknown genotypes pretty well in terms of yield. Now, protein, starch, and oil predict about 64 uh, the, the, the prediction ability of, of protein, starch, and oil alone for estimating yield is about 0.64. So in this case, it tells us that there probably is some composition aspect, that's probably most of it, but then the relatedness aspect, like the way genomic selection works, um, is, is probably a, a, a picking up that difference. It's a big, big function there. So what's really exciting that we can do with this, that we can't do with genomic selection, is we can predict untested material. So these are separate breeding populations, and some of them actually had high, quite high prediction ability, far exceeding what you would expect from an unrelated population in an unrelated environment by genomic selection. Okay? So this tells us that there's definitely a large composition component of phenomic selection, but then that relatedness component is what puts us over the top. And so to just sum this all up uh, with you know, the phenomic selection from the NEARS with the UAS work, um, this study was just released on BioArchive a couple of weeks ago by my student Alper Adek, and he shows for the first time that UAS temporal phenomic prediction is about equivalent to genomic prediction. So in this case, we have genomic prediction, uh, temporal phenomic prediction using multispectral um, UAS, and temporal phenomic prediction using um, red, green, blue, so a uh, phantom four in this case. And we can see the various cross-validation data sets. Um, CV1 is, is training on uh, tested uh, genotypes in tested environments. CV4 is untested genotypes in untested environments, so we expect that to perform the most poorly. And we can see that, especially in the case of uh, CV2, right, which is untested genotypes in tested environments, uh, temporal pheno pheno phenomic prediction uh, outperforms genomic prediction. Now, it's important to note here that the genomic prediction used 153,000 markers, whereas our temporal phenomic prediction model used, it, used about 10, uh, 1,068 phenomic features. That's 89 different vegetation indices by 12 time points. And then RGB just had less data because there were less spectral bands. So just to wrap up, what does the future in plant breeding look like, in my opinion? 
Um, we're probably going to have additional traits of dependent traits of interest, especially as we're able to develop these calibrations. So yield, nutrition, ecosystem services for a number of different uh, genotypes. We're going to take our standard physiological measures like flowering time or leaf angle um, for a while, probably. But then we're going to add in these temporal phenomic trait measures like plant height at 30 days, plant height at 60 days, plant height at 90 days. And then we're going to add these segregating remote sensing measures like in terms of phenomic selection, such as various unknown phenotypes, different vegetation indices. We can probably also include our genomic measures still. There's probably some additional information that those will capture. Put all that into a relationship matrix building framework, and then hopefully eventually we can include the growth models in this to be able to predict over time which genotypes are likely to be the most, uh, the, the most highest yielding and the best for our environment. And that's ultimately going to allow us to predict the best untested hybrids for untested environments. So I'll end there. Uh, hopefully I didn't take up too much time, and I'll look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you.